petition for it because they aren't actually employees of the university and any of their scholarships uh, actually go towards their education, not their talent. The next thing is how unions uh, actually make it really difficult for employees to leave if they want to. Um, it's really easy to join a union today and to create a union, but it's pretty difficult for employees to leave. So it can take as little as 10 days for a union to be formed now, and the National Labor Board also had them uh, be able to create micro unions, but it can sometimes take years to leave based on how many votes they might need. Something that affects New Jersey personally um, is the NJEA. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this if you grew up in New South Jersey or just any school district in New Jersey. Um, and they essentially had a big influence over the governor election that just happened. Back in 2011, uh, there was a pension dispute that Sweeney, who was one of the candidates running, came into conflict with the Teachers Association, and they weren't really too happy with this, so they were trying to look for a different candidate. Typically, they don't want to vote Republican. A lot of times they vote Democratic, so they had to find a different candidate. Um, the NJEA spent over $8 million on anti-Sweeney campaigns, and they actually put a lot of their funds in support of Phil Murphy. So that's a pretty big influence, considering that Democrats put about $11 million into his campaign. For the outcome of the election, Sweeney actually did end up, or not Sweeney, sorry, Murphy actually end up did winning the election. So you can really see how much of an influence unions have, not only because of their votes, but also because of their monetary support that they can offer. Um, just to summarize what I was talking about, these are a couple of things up here. And what can we take away from recent union news is that they, unions, while their numbers are on the decline, they actually do still have a pretty big influence. And uh, we should consider that when we are going through our lives. So next I'm going to introduce uh, Lauren to talk about the laws. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren. I'm going to talk about the laws around unions. Um, some topics I'm going to go over are the different acts, the labor union contract, violations of unions and two unions, and some info about the laws today. So the first thing I want to go over is the Railway Labor Act. It started in 1926 and it originally applied to railroads, and then in 1936 it was amended to cover airlines. The goal was to ensure that there was no disruption to interstate commerce. So the RLA is administered by the National Mediation Board. It is also known as MNB. It is a federal agency, and it outlines very specific and detailed processes for dispute resolution in these industries. Next, I'm going to talk about the Norris LaGuardia Act. It's also known as the Anti-Injunction Bill. It barred federal courts from issuing injunctions against nonviolent labor disputes and barred employers from interfering with workers joining a union. An injunction is a court order that requires a party to do something or refrain from doing something. The Norris LaGuardia Act was a result of common yellow doll contracts in which a worker agreed to join a union before even accepting, to not join a union before even accepting the job. The Norris LaGuardia Act made yellow doll contracts unenforceable in courts. Next is the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act started in 1935. It is sometimes called the National Labor Relations Act. It was passed changing the way employers can react to several aspects of unions. Employers must allow freedom of association and organization and cannot interfere with employees who form a union. Now the National Labor Relations Board, it oversees the Wagner Act and handles any complaints that may arise from the act. For example, the NLRB works with employees in a company in Tennessee who got fired after forming a union. So they worked with an attorney to fight and they got them all rehired. The Taft-Hartley Act was passed in 1947 and it amended the Wagner Act. It focused on unfair acts by the unions. For example, it outlawed, outlawed strikes that were not authorized by the union called wildcat strikes. It also prohibited secondary actions where one union goes on strike in sympathy for the other. The Landrum Griffith Act or LMRDA report the Reporting and Disclosure Act passed in 1959. It required unions to hold secret elections, submit their financial reports, and create standards for governing expulsion of a member from the union. Now the labor union contract. 
So I'll be going over collective bargaining, the different components of what a tentative agreement is and how to act in what is called good faith. So collective bargaining is a labor union contract is called a collective bargaining agreement. The negotiation process involves two committees, one that represents the interests of union members and another that represents the management's interests. Some components, the labor union contracts have several components including sections on wages, benefits, working schedules, seniority-based bidding for shifts, holiday schedules, and also handling grievances. A tentative agreement, when the labor union and the employer reach a tentative agreement, they draft what's called a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU. So the MOU contains all the elements of a final contract, but it's not yet ratified by the union. Next is good faith. The NLRA governs collective bargaining process by requiring good faith efforts from both the union and from the employer. So good faith refers to the intention to be fair, open, and honest regardless of outcome or of interaction. So when you're bargaining in good faith, this would include like scheduling bargaining sessions at mutually convenient times, you know, coming to the sessions prepared to negotiate and refrain from intimidating behaviors. Next, I'm going to talk about examples of conduct that violate the law. Threatening employees with loss of jobs or benefits if they join is one big example. Promising benefits to employees to discourage their union support or sometimes they assign employees um, more difficult work because of being in a union. Some examples of labor organization conduct that violates the law. Some people threat that they will lose their job unless they support the union. Striking over issues unrelated to employment terms and conditions. And promising benefits to employees to discourage their union support. Now I'm gonna get in more detail about OSHA. So <laughs> unions have been involved with OSHA since its inception. Sometimes unions file complaints with OSHA on behalf of workers that the union represents. Other times the union will work with the agency on industry-wide initiatives. So union laws today. Many people say that union labor laws do not meet the needs of American workers today. They believe that the laws need to be modernized because they did not truly reflect what we need right going on right now. Many people believe that Congress should remove, it's called Section 8A2, from the prescription on employee involvement programs. So um, the employee involvement programs gave workers a voice and improved working conditions, yet for some reason it was still illegal. Next, I'll be giving Scott. All right, so my name's Scott. Like she said before, um, I'm going to talk to you guys about the pros and cons of unions, as well as giving an overview of everything that we've learned today. Um, basically, when you talk about unions, they gave us a lot of good benefits. We got longer week day, we got a shorter work week, we got weekends, overtime, paid vacations, and things of such nature. The pros to unions, union employees on average make more money per week than non-union workers. Now, this happens through the collective bargaining that the unions themselves actually conduct. You know, that's them at basically talking to your boss and all before you go into there, and they're saying, you know, our, deserver works, our worker deserves this amount. The next pro is the benefits that you get. Most union workers receive better benefit packages than most non-unionized workers. Now that, in today's world, most of your jobs will offer you a benefit package, but the unionized benefit packages that you get by working for the union, they tend to be a lot better. The next is the concept of the work week. Another pro to unions was you no longer had to work a 16 hour day for six days a week, and you had to sit there and Basically, you were a slave to your employer. You got off on Sunday because that was the day that everyone got to go to church. Other than that, that was it. There was no other concept of getting off for any reason. The next is the security that you get from your job. You have a very good job security. You cannot be fired when you're a union worker for any basic reason. It is actually very hard and is a very lengthy process for an employer to get you fired. You have to actually commit multiple infractions on the company. You, know, you get one, two, three slaps on the wrist. Another benefit is that there is power in numbers. Divided, they beg. Together, they bargain. When a company has an entire workforce that doesn't want to work unless they have their requirements met, they want a weekend, you can't have your entire company take off. 
you need to end up agreeing to a certain term. The next is the cons. The cons to a union is that you basically, you have your union dues. This is money that each week is taken out of your pay that helps pay for the benefits that the union gives you, which is a good thing, but it leads into the next thing of what that actually goes towards. You might not agree with what your specific union, they might choose to back a certain political candidate and you basically have no choice in that. You in turn are supporting them regardless of if that's in your interest or not. It doesn't really matter as to what you want to do or say. The next thing that we have going up oh, is that unions are more of a networking thing nowadays. Before it was you wanted to get into a union, you had to be a highly skilled worker. Now it's kind of shifting a little more towards between skill to who you know. They're basically the union recruiter could be someone that you know through a family friend or something and that's how you end up getting the job. Um, the next is that the basic tension that comes between unions and the employers, it's in their nature to create a hostile work environment. Both sides want to do the best thing for each other, so sometimes that can lead to conflicts between the two and create somewhat of a friction between the employer and the union themselves. Um, the next is your paycheck. Um, they determine your wage. You know, you don't have the option to go and talk to your boss about possibly getting your raise in two months instead of the three months. You could end up going into the union overqualified in the beginning, but you're going to get the same pay rate as someone who just comes in fresh off the street. Um, basically, now I'm going to start the review um, of everything that we learned from the presentation. Um, basically... Would you guys rather have a review or just leave? Let's get out of here. Sweet. Yep. Good job. Thanks, everybody.